All right, uh, I'm very pleased to be able to give this lecture um, for the Composers Forum, and I want to extend my thanks to Dr. Levinson in particular for inviting me. And uh, I regret that I can't be there in person, but hopefully this will be of some value anyway. Uh, I'm going to try to do a number of things. Uh, I'll introduce myself to you and then give you sort of a general sense of the philosophy of music, and then try to build a more personal, um, specific argument that comes out of my own research um, as a way to kind of um, maybe take things into a direction that you may not be familiar with. Uh, the philosophy of music is really sort of a g general theme for us here, but I want to give a kind of uh, evolutionary approach. My own background is in um, the philosophy of biology, and so I tend to see things uh, through the lens of evolution. And this has been fairly rewarding as of late because of some of the developments, both in evolution and also in brain science. All right, um, so I myself have been uh, writing a number of books and uh, of late I did sort of a, tr a trio of books uh, having to do with the emotions and culture. And uh, music is a long time interest of, of mine and I've been playing um, uh, professionally since I was in college and had the good fortune to play in Chicago on the blues and jazz scene. And so I consider myself to have been very lucky to play with some great uh, heroes of mine. Uh, I was in the house band at Buddy Guy's Legends and uh, because of that was able to play with some of the great blues artists, some of whom have actually uh, s since then passed away. Um, I was doing work on the imagination now for the past I've been doing work on the imagination for the past decade or so, and uh, originally I had an interest in uh, the culture of monsters, and p particularly pictorial imagery and monster stories and what they might be saying about the cultures that produce them. So I wrote a book on monsters for Oxford, um, and that has uh, sort of con I've sort of continued this work in different formats. What's perhaps more interesting and relevant for us in terms of music is that. Um, a couple of years ago, I pub published a book with University of Chicago Press called The Evolution of Imagination. And here I started to develop the idea that the imagination is not only neglected in philosophical and psychological circles, but um, it's oftentimes treated as this kind of uh, uh, cultural activity, that, well, kind of window dressing on you know, cultural and cognitive activity that gets added sort of last in the story of human uh, evolution. I actually think in uh, contradiction to that approach, I actually think the imagination, and in particular improvisational thinking and acting, is maybe the most um, primordial form of human mind, uh, human problem-solving, human consciousness. And so I try to make a case for improvisation as a fundamental form of, co of cognition. And that's gonna come back in this talk uh, when we start talking about music, um, near the end, I sort of develop a theory about musical cognition. And then more recently, I've developed uh, with uh, my colleague, Dr. Rami Gabriel, uh, a psychologist here at Columbia, um, a book called The Emotional Mind, and we published that with Harvard last year. And that is, um, some of that work will also come to the fore um, in the second part of today's talk. Uh, it's basically a kind of novel approach to the emotions and human evolution. All right, so I want to show you uh, kind of a humorous slide. This um, picture was shared with me recently by a friend. If you look at this image, of course, on the left-hand side, you can see the great Bo Diddley, one of the great um, creators of rock and roll, together with artists like Chuck Berry. And then you'll see him in the 1990s in this image on the right, and then this frightened <laughs> fellow in the background is yours truly. Uh, that's me in the 90s playing with um, Bo Diddley at the original Buddy Guys Legends. And uh, it was wonderful because uh, we started playing with him in the early 90s. And then for several years, whenever he would come to town, he would request uh, our musical group as his background band, as his backing band. And so it was great to play with him on several occasions and get a sense of what it's like to work with a a musical genius and a master improviser, and also a character that's a little bit like the Buddha, sort of in his sort of Zen aphorisms. Uh, in any case, I wanted to at least give you a sense of where I'm coming from. My own musical background is um, much more in the sort of oral tradition, 
much more um, steeped in blues as a kind of um, improvisational style. I'm interested in the way in which blues emerged and developed out of African music and the unique merge with American traditions that created early jazz and so forth. So I've had some uh, experience in those areas and I think that colors the way I see music as a philosopher because oftentimes, you know, you might have a philosopher of art who does aesthetics who, who may not be actually a practicing artist and I think it really does change the way you see things if you are also a practitioner. Sometimes you're too close to it uh, if you're a practitioner and you need some detached disinterest, but hopefully we'll find the middle ground. All right, let me give you a, just a quick sketch about uh, the way in which um, many philosophers approach music. There's many areas in the philosophy of music that are rich and um, producing good research. I would say one of the areas that does interest me is the metaphysics of music, and I thought I'd just say a couple of words about this before we move on. If we think about, um, I mean, one thing that's kind of a puzzle right away is how do we define music? There is some significant disagreement about what actually makes up music. And so we could say, well, it, it seems to be intentionally organized sound. It can't just be organized sound that happens naturally, like, you know, I suppose there's a rhythm to waves beating on the shore, and that is interesting, and one could use that in compositions. But presumably there's something intentional going on in music that's quite different from just natural sound patterns. Uh, does it require certain auditory properties like pitch and rhythm? Well, it seems to, and many philosophers would agree that that's a sort of essential feature. And then, uh, does it require certain aesthetic properties? Uh, for example, beauty, the sublime, particular emotional states. It's very common for uh, philosophers, particularly of the aesthetic branch of philosophy, to think in terms of what is the beautiful, what is sublime. Famously, um, you know, Immanuel Kant, the German philosopher, uh, tried to figure out what is it that is sort of universal about an aesthetic judgment like that painting or that vase is beautiful, and what is particular or um, peculiar. And so it's a strange combination if you think about it. When you make an aesthetic judgment like this um, sunset or this painting is beautiful or this piece of music is beautiful, you're strangely combining, according to Kant, something that's conceptual and universal and something that's perceptual. In the, in the case of music, it would be an auditor auditory perception and it's, it's part of the body's way of processing information. So what's the relationship then between the conceptual and the perceptual? And that was a big puzzle for philosophers uh, like Immanuel Kant and aesthetic philosophers after Kant. Um, some sort of debate there about whether things really, you know, whether beauty should be the ultimate goal in music and you might contrast uh, the sort of classical ideals of, of Bach, you know, in the Baroque period or Mozart in the classical period with some of the, the more uh, dissonant uh, sounds that one finds in the Romantic tradition and, you know, the 20th century traditions of Stravinsky and so forth, there the, the idea is that you could be having an experience that was aesthetically pleasing but also vaguely painful. And this is also an interesting puzzle for philosophers. Why are we attracted to some sounds and some, you know, visual pictorial representations that are um, dissonant and disturbing? Um, and so that's, I think, a very interesting puzzle that philosophers have been working on for a long time. But there's also this question of ontology. Uh, what is uh, a musical work of art? Uh, is it the piece um, itself, and in what sense is it the piece of music? Is it the written version that the composer has actually written down? Let's say Beethoven has written down a symphony on paper, is, it, is the essential piece of music uh, this version? It would seem not, um, and yet it does seem, you know, very much tied to the music form. I mean, there's a sort of interesting puzzle here, which is if you say, well, the music, the true uh, composition, it, or the piece of music really is the performance, then there's this weird puzzle that every performance of Stravinsky's Rite of Spring no doubt has you know, wrong notes in it. And you're in this strange 
sort of uh, paradox of saying, well, the true piece of music also has all these errors in it when compared to the written piece of music. And so you can see the kind of, it's a bit of a head game that philosophers like to get into with these puzzles. Uh, but generally speaking, this is, a, is an interesting question. What is the relationship of the performance to the written piece? Is there a kind of ur performance, a kind of, you know, archetypical performance? And then what are what's the relationship of all the other uh, deviations of permutation performances, subsequent performances and interpretations, and how do they relate to the real piece of music? Um, and then there's other other sort of interesting ontological or metaphysical questions, like what does the music refer to? If you have a painting, let's say it's a Picasso painting of, uh, or Van Gogh's painting of shoes, let's say, or Picasso's painting of an African mask, you can say, well, the, the painting is in a sense a representation and therefore it refers to these shoes. Um, and you can't quite say this in instrumental music. Um, when you have song lyrics added to it, of course, the, the references are much more clear and obvious. So you could be telling a story and the, the characters of the story and the events could be the referent. But in instrumental music, um, it's unclear what the music is referring to. And that's a bit of an ontological puzzle, and philosophers have noticed it. Is music a thing? Um, it would not seem to be a thing, uh, like um, paintings or vases or other works of art uh, that could be said to be an object um, or decorative work, for that matter. Um, so is music then a process? And in some ways, it, do it does seem to be a process. Or is it an attribute of something else? Um, or is music, a uh, musical composition, a kind of mental entity? And this is an interesting issue because there's, a, there's an old way of thinking about this that goes back to Plato, who said, well, um, in a sense, if you play you know, a major scale on a flute and you sing the major scale and, you, or, and then you play it on the guitar, you can break the flute you could kill me, I suppose. You could end my life, the singer. You could destroy the guitar or let the guitar decay and fall apart. But in some sense, the scale hasn't changed. There's something about musical scales, the Greeks thought, particularly the idealists like Plato and Pythagoras, they thought, well, there's something strangely eternal about these music forms. And it's basically their mathematical quality. It's the fact that they have, they're composed of certain intervals and you could play that scale in ancient Greece, you could play it today, you could play it on Jupiter, it would still be the same, even though the material physical world is constantly changing and um, breaking down. Uh, nonetheless, these mathematical properties of music seem to be, uh, if not eternal, then very long lasting. So this has led some people to think about music as in a platonic fashion that there's a kind of ideal or abstract idea, which is the music composition. Perhaps it existed in the composer's mind, perhaps through the medium of sound and performance, we were able to access that abstract idea via this medium. So these are the kinds of sort of ontological questions that some people would want to pose. To contrast with that, you might argue that a piece of music um, is really more like um, a genealogical population there's a kind of core performance and written version, but then it, it has all kinds of descendants and sort of the different music forms are related to, to each other via a family resemblance. This is a, in a way to sort of ascribe a kind of Wittgensteinian approach to, to music. Uh, Ludwig Wittgenstein being a 20th century philosopher who, who had a different way of thinking about abstract ideas or types or essences. All right, so that's just a, a way of getting you into the, the sort of thing that philosophers might be doing in terms of uh, music and composition. It's not going to be the main interest of this talk, and in many ways my own work only touches on this tangentially. Instead, what I want to talk to you about are the cognitive roots of music. And I'm going to look at this phylogenetically and ontogenetically. So what is phylogeny and ontogeny, or at least Maybe I'll remind you if, you've, if you're familiar with this from biology. I want to talk a bit about the phylogeny of music, which is basically the, the species level evolutionary history of music. Why did 
music evolve in the first place? Why was it selected for, if it was selected for, such that it persists and is so um, ubiquitous throughout, throughout all human populations? Um, and then also, I want to talk a little bit about the ontogeny of music, which is how does music um, develop in the individual in terms of our psychological um, and even our physical development? Um, how is it that you, as an individual, became musical, became sensitive to music, understood music, and can, in fact, in some cases, make music or produce music? So these are parallel questions connected to each other, phylogeny and ontogeny. I want to sort of do both of those. Well, obviously, it's going to be sketchy. There's only so much I can do in this amount of time, but at least you'll, you'll see a way to maybe go forward if uh, any of this interests you. All right. In terms of... Uh, the evolution of music, I'm going to give us a quick tour of just from the archaeology up through thinking about um, music and natural selection and cultural selection. And then in terms of uh, our individual development, I want to talk about how does music have meaning? What are the semantics of music? And that will be, I believe, a kind of developmental story about how we first interacted with our parents and our communities and developed a sense of um, conditioning in a way for sound. All right, let's start out with um, adaptation, exaptation, or byproduct. There's a big debate um, in terms of how music fits. Uh, the famously, if you look over here on the right, you'll see a famous evolutionary psychologist and linguist Steven Pinker uh, suggested back in 97, he was sort of flummoxed by the the question of whether music would be adaptive or valuable. Why would it be selected for? And he suggested that it may just be a happy accident or a byproduct. Kind of, he referred to it as auditory cheesecake. <laughs> uh, and more sort of, he thought, well, maybe it just comes with having uh, more general cognitive adaptations like language. So if you have a really big brain that's very good at cognition, and things like symbol manipulation in the form of language, then he suggested maybe music just comes along for the ride and it wasn't really selected for um, in terms of natural selection. Now I have to say that is a minority position. Very few people take that view anymore, but it was provocative and it led to a lot of good thinking about music and the evolution of culture generally. So what are the ways in which things um, are retained? in an organism, in a population, in a culture. So there are mechanisms of adaptive heredity. And so the big ones that, that everyone knows would be sort of natural selection. This was Darwin's mechanism of evolution. And sexual selection and dual inheritance or gene culture coevolution and mimetics. So let me just sort of outline these very briefly. There's other ones too. You'll see on the list here, Evo Devo, epigenesis, genetic drift, founder's effect. These are all ways in which populations end up having traits that proliferate. Um, and I, I just want to take maybe the top four and mention them briefly with regard, to, maybe with regard to art and music specifically. Obviously, natural selection works by, um, you have chance variation and you have natural variation um, uh, mutations. Uh, that uh, exists just in the normal reproduction of genetic information in, in sexual organisms like human beings. So you can basically have, you know, dominant and recessive uh, traits uh, meeting. And what happens is when some of these traits are beneficial for the population, that means that those individuals are able to live long enough to procreate and pass on those heritable traits to their offspring. So those traits then spread through the population. Fairly easy, straightforward natural selection. One question is why, why would something so seemingly useless as art uh, in general, and maybe music in particular, why would natural selection be selecting for that or against that? And um, what I want to develop here in the course of this discussion is that there are in fact many ways in which it helps individuals and populations survive better. So we'll get to this as we go along. Another way of thinking about evolution is sexual selection. Darwin developed this idea back in the 1870s and he said, well, sometimes um, you'll see in the course of like a peacock uh, 
they'll have these amazing plumage and beautiful flather, feathers, and they attract uh, the peahens so that they basically can reproduce and procreate so that those patterns will, will basically be proliferated and basically reproduced in the larger population. Because in this particular case I'm giving, females are drawn to, to the elaborate plumage, and this elaborate plumage may well be a kind of indication of fitness. So even though it costs a lot for a peacock to grow this amazing plumage, nonetheless, it also has tremendous benefits. And then these kinds of seemingly aesthetic traits get proliferated in the population. So the argument here is sexual selection may be why music was um, selected for. If someone can produce music, it makes you very attractive to the opposite sex, and therefore you might actually uh, be able to um, procreate more readily and then pass on these traits to others. So I'll leave you to fill in all the, the sort of good examples of this that might be on your mind. <laughs> all right, um, something very important which emerged more recently is dual inheritance theory, which is that there's a wonderful connection between gene and culture coevolution. Sometimes uh, what's being selected for is a kind of capacity um, and it, like a famous example of this is that um, your ability to drink cow's milk is because you have lactase is something that your body produces which allows you to break, break down lactose which is within cow's milk and lactase is something that all humans produce in an early age to help us with mother's milk but if you have a culture that then uh, raises uh, domesticates cows and produces all this cow's milk, then suddenly you can keep drinking milk later and later in life. Most you know, human beings without access to domesticated cows and cow's milk stop producing lactase after they wean off their mothers and it basically they become lactose intolerant. You can see this in different populations around the planet. People of East Asian um, uh, origin, people of Chinese descent, like my son for example, they sometimes have a hard time breaking down lactose and can be lactose intolerant. But if your culture has kept you drinking milk all along, then your body keeps producing the lactase that, pre that, that breaks it down. So there's these interesting combinations of culture and biological capacities which are constantly being, um, uh, that are basically interpenetrated uh, and in this kind of dialectical relationship with each other. And one th thesis is that music is like this that the more you have a culture that makes music and creates these capacities for music that are genetically engraved, then there becomes a sort of premium placed on these traits and these abilities such that they start to actually be selected for by natural selection as well. Um, and then finally, uh, memes are, everybody knows what memes are. My son, of course, is constantly uh, checking memes on phone and I'm always getting the best and uh, the best and the most humorous memes, but um, you may not be familiar with the fact that memes was a, a term invented by a biologist named um, Richard Dawkins, and Dawkins argued that um, you have to think about a meme as being a kind of analogy to a gene. So it's a unit of information that is um, that reproduces through the population just like a unit of genetic information a gene can also be reproduced through a population. Now in the case of memes what what Dawkins was thinking about was things like culture uh, and specific things in culture like religion for example is a, he thinks is kind of a meme or a set of memes a whole really s system of interlocking memes and that we as a culture then transmit that. We transmit it horizontally by, in a sense, um, I can tell you about my religion, you can tell me about your religion even if I wasn't raised that way. And so in a sense, memes, religious memes can travel horizontally across populations and individuals, but also vertically because parents raise their children as Christians or as Muslims or as Jews, and then you can see that the transmission of these memes, a set of ideas, beliefs, and practices can be sort of promulgated via this method of mimetics. So music clearly has mimetic qualities. It's very clear that in music education you're trying to pass 
you know, um, behavioral patterns that are techniques that really help in the performance of music, ideas, notation, concepts, chordal arrangements, all of this stuff can be thought of it in mimetic terms, which, which then get spread horizontally and vertically and actually have sort of evolutionary um, impact. Um, all right, so <clears throat> let's look at um, a little bit more specifically what some views of uh, ep the evolution of music were starting in the 19th century, but these are really still with us. Darwin famously said um, that he thought um, it, this was in the descent of, I think it was in the descent of man, which would be like 1872, possibly this was in the expression of emotions. He said, well, um, the original kind of music must have been something like bird songs, which were, he thought, ways in which you could attract mates. And he thought that um, human beings, well, you know, mammals first, eventually, and then eventually primates, and then eventually homo, uh, the genus Homo, and then eventually Homo sapiens, would have developed similar ways of drawing mates. So these are kind of, you have to think about music, original music as, as a kind of romantic cooing, which brings your mate to you, and then you're basically able to have sex and procreate. So you can see, he thought it did have an adaptive value, and he thought that since it's clearly having this role in birds, then why not in human beings? And there's some reason to think there's, there, there's something to this because some of the other adaptive features of birdsong are clearly things that we also use songs and music for, namely not just drawing um, uh, possible mates, but also marking territory and identifying yourself in a group of competitors for resources. Uh, clearly we use music this way too. Tribes have used music as a way of identifying themselves and also saying like, I'm here, or you know, our, there's an us and a them, and you know these songs, then you're one of us, and if you don't, then you're one of them. So there's a sense in which sort of tribal us-them relations between competing, competing populations, music and song has played some role in that regard. Now, Herbert Spencer, who you may know, sort of actually invented the word survival of the fittest, so he's a contemporary of Darwin's. In many ways, he agreed with Darwin, uh, but he thought Darwin was wrong about music, and he developed a slightly different theory, which I'm calling here the blurt theory. This is just my own word for it. I don't have a better one, but it seems to catch it. Um, and he thought, well, music originates in the spontaneous overflow of energy that we feel under certain peak psychological experiences. So he thought um, when you get really angry, you make a certain kind of guttural noise or yell or scream, it just comes out of you as a kind of byproduct. And he thought then that that would create a certain kind of music that would be um, involve aggression. And he thought that when you're sad, you make certain kinds of sounds. I don't know, maybe these are kind of whimpering noises or something. And lo and behold, if you can keep elaborating that through culture, um, you end up getting the kind of scales and modes that might lead one to identify, you know, emotions as sad. So sadness produces certain kinds of uh, vocalizations, and then we associate these with sad music. So he thought that all the major emotions had their own kind of um, rudimentary musical lexicon that then more sophisticated mind and culture gets to elaborate and build into to, to more the music forms that we recognize. So there'd be sad, there'd be angry, there'd be happy. Uh, so he says basically music is the language of the emotions. Now that's pretty old stuff. That goes back to the late 1800s. I believe Spencer was writing this in the 1880s. Um, but more recent developments in brain science and affective neuroscience suggest that um, in a way Spencer was really onto something. Uh, back then. Let me give a very brief sketch uh, and, and just at least remind us of why archaeology is important here. So we get these glimpses into prehistory. Um, we have some basic kind of bone flutes. Uh, we have drums. Uh, we, we, it's hard to know uh, what these things mean because they're so old and we don't have any way to corroborate our thesis based on them. In southern Germany at, Hol at Holfell's cave, flute fragments were discovered that date back 42,000 to 43,000 years ago. 
And there's a debate as to whether Neanderthals had flute technology or whether it is a strictly Homo sapiens instrument. But just to show you how sort of co complex that is, even though that case is fairly established, there, there is a cave in Slovenia containing a flute made from a cave bear femur dubbed uh, the Divjababa flute. Uh, it was thought to be played by Neanderthals who lived in that region. But then in 2015, some archaeologists argued that the diatonic scale, the holes that were sort of made throughout this bone, were in fact merely accidents of hyenas chewing on the bones, punching these serial hole patterns that we misinterpreted. And that just goes to show you how difficult it is to figure out um, what, what, are, what are instruments, um, what could be an instrument, how much human intentionality is in them. And even though most of this emerges around 40,000 years ago, one wonders whether the archaeological record just is obscuring or, or is imperfect such that some of these musical instruments go way back. And some of them we think are musical instruments are not. Um, there's another way to try to look at um, music from our prehistory, and that's also had some important successes, although it's got some controversy too, namely comparative anthropology. If you look at the way in which um, indigenous peoples are using music all around the world in um, sort of undeveloped or, or less developed regions of the world, the argument is, well, this at least might be how music was used in our prehistory, which we can't directly observe. So the subsistence lifestyles of modern indigenous peoples replicate hunter-gatherer conditions of the Upper Paleolithic period and early agricultural conditions of the Holocene. But there's no guarantee that current practices recapitulate ancient ones. So you might see African tribes, for example, using drums and songs in a certain way. It's not clear that that's how it would have been done um, in our prehistory. But it certainly does lead us to think that there are a range of possibilities. And if only that, I think it's good work. And there has been some impressive work in this area, too. All right. So now let's look at some of the uh, adaptive social functions of music. There seem to be some uh, universal trends as we look across the globe, both historically and comparatively, um, at music production and appreciation. And uh, you'll see a series of images here and ideas. The first image you'll see here on the left is um, the African griot tradition from West Africa. These are storytellers um, that basically um, encapsulate songs and the history of the tribe. And so the griot will be not just an entertainer and a storyteller with music, but also a kind of um, historical memory and the people or the, the local population will understand itself through this music and this kind of storytelling. Uh, most uh, populations have used m music in this way as a record, as a history. Um, this tradition was, of course, imported into the Americas um, in, the, in the slave trade because many of these artists were brought to the Americas, uh, obviously against their will, and um, were transplanted here. But then, if you know the history of African-American music, uh, you'll see that the griot ended up um, having a huge influence on a kind of call and response culture, the kind of rich storytelling culture, the mix of even of religious traditions. And eventually, many people can hear uh, this music, this style, this storytelling in early, well, in, in field hollers, then eventually in things like um, early blues music, and then eventually up into early jazz. Certain kind of patterns and, and uh, rhythmic uh, repetitions and emotional styles and even pentatonic scale and this kind of stuff. Um, then you'll see here this kind of humorous image is a, a giant phallus, um, in a Jap it's actually a fairly contemporary a Japanese fertility ceremony that has that goes back, you know, centuries in terms of history, and it's very common for music to be a part of fertility festivals. So people are looking not only to have a good harvest, um, but also to repopulate their own population. So have a good harvest of human beings as well, and very oftentimes music is connected to um, courtship. Uh, to marriage, to procreation in human populations too.
It's a very big part of uh, fertility festivals. And also music has had a big role to play in terms of war and solidarity. And these are music in these cases, it's not like just decoration on what otherwise would be uh, war or fertility. Music is an essential feature of these activities. Um, one of the things that can inspire and basically um, coalesce a group into aggressive acts against a, competit a comp competitor group are in fact uh, fight songs, war songs. And you'll see this oftentimes happening as a way to prepare for warfare. The musicians and the songsters will come in and basically build up a kind of fury and you'll sort of demonize the other in songs. And then also when war is winding down, you'll find that music and songs help to repair and uh, to pacify the groups as well. So these are pr pretty dramatic social functions that music seems to play a very significant role in. Now, uh, what are the selectable uses and benefits of music? Uh, there seems to be ways in which music helps the individual and the group. Let's look at some of the, you know, the more sort of personal and psychological aspects. Clearly music is, uh, has a role to play in psychological catharsis. Ever since Aristotle, up through Freud, and up to contemporary psychology, we know that the emotional palette can be very helpful and adaptive, but it can also be o sort of override us. And we might have emotions that we need to sort of clear out of the system or to, to get away from. And oftentimes music helps us to sort of download or offload um, troubling emotions and to take on board positive affects or positive emotions. This seems to be a large part of emotional management, and clearly our, we oftentimes use music as a form of emotional management. Music is clearly a form of communication. It's, uh, the obvious one, I guess, is a form of recreation. Um, it's a form of social bonding, as we were saying before. Knowing these songs and these music forms brings us together as a group and creates social, social solidarity. It's also a form of spiritual cultivation and communion. And I'll talk a little bit more about this later, but um, it's pretty clear that uh, music can bring you to places, psychological states that are very different. They're ecstatic states, you know, might be the, the technical terminology here. You're not in your own little ego relationship with the world. You're, you're sort of, the ego consciousness is sort of blown away in the musical experience, and you're having something more like a transcendent experience. And it's pretty clear that music is extremely good at bringing about these kinds of, of valuable spiritual emotions. All right, now let's talk a little bit about the cognitive structures and music. So we've laid out a little bit about why music could have been selected for and why it would be adaptive. Let's talk a little bit about the kind of cognitive elements or structures that have to be there for us to be able to produce music, create music, or to understand music. Um, there are these musical forms, so if you look on the left-hand side, the, I just sort of chose these randomly just to give you a sense uh, what you're all familiar with here. It, it's, it's a composer's forum. Uh, you're going to know that there's all this, these great um, musical structures that can be repeated, taught, replicated. Some very um, sort of common ones are call and response, both in terms of song, vocal song, but also in terms of music. The sonata form where you have exposition, development, and then recapitulation. You think about the rondo form, which would be a statement of a theme A, then a novel theme B, then a return to A, then another novel theme C. So you get an A, B, A, C, A, D format. Uh, if you think about the American song form, you get, you know, A, A, B, A, you know, verse, verse, chorus, verse. 12-bar um, blues has a very specific form uh, before it turns around and goes into this rep repetition. Now, one of the things I've been interested in is trying to think about this like a cognitive scientist. What are the cognitive structures that have to be in place in order for us to be able to do these kind of song, song forms that we're familiar with? And one of the things that's really exciting is that people are now starting to really study things like rhythmic entrainment. And entrainment is the idea that if I, you know, clap in a certain form, you know, it's very quick that uh, the whole room can start clapping with me. And this ability, which, you know, children can do, and all human beings seem to be able to do across cultures, is something that animals have a very hard time with. 
not all animals. There's some fairly amazing uh, cases of animal entrainment, rhythmic entrainment. There's this crazy cockatoo, I think, this crazy bird that's kind of famous on the internet, which can really get into a groove. <laughs> And uh, But even our primate cousins are particularly bad at entrainment. So one of the things that I've been interested in is how does how is it that we're able to lock into rhythms uh, together collectively? And um, there seems to be some interesting work being done on the cerebellum, for example, um, in terms of sequencing of uh, motor skills. Um, a lot of this is quite mysterious, but there is increasing uh, brain studies and cognitive science uh, on this area. And then you have to sort of realize that in order for us to, to create and appreciate music, we need some fairly sophisticated uh, memory abilities, memory capacities. Um, memory, I think, as some of you know, could be carved up into semantic, episodic, and implicit memory very briefly. Um, a semantic memory is sort of like if I ask you, you know, what's the, you know, the, what's the capital of Illinois, you might know Springfield, but you've never been there. Um, whereas episodic memory, if you remember you, that you've actually been to Springfield, you'll have memories of Springfield, but you're in those memories. And this is quite different from having just a semantic informational memory. And then implicit memory would be things like the kind of procedural memory of muscle memory. So when you when you study on your instrument, let's say guitar or piano, you develop this kind of muscle memory where, you know, as a performer and an improviser, I've been in situations, I'm sure many of you have, where you're in the middle of a tune and you, you can't remember what's next, but your hand just sort of remembers what to do and where to go. And these are this is a kind of embodied implicit or procedural memory and it turns out that emotional memory is like this too. We can have um, all kinds of emotional memories that are kind of tagged and in the system that are cued and come up uh, through triggers, but we don't have a whole lot of uh, explicit um, sort of... Uh, we can't really identify them very clearly in the discursive rational conscious mind. They're a little deeper than that, even though they come to the fore and influence our, our feelings and our behaviors. And then there's an interesting question about grammar and recursion. If you think about music and the analogy to language, there's this question about, well, can anybody learn music? You know, can anyone learn language? Well, uh, famously, a linguist Noam Chomsky, uh, as some of you know, uh, hypothesized that you can't really just learn a language by having language thrown at you over and over again. Because uh, it looks like there's some deep grammar that can't be learned by just hearing words over and over again. And instead, he argued for a kind of uh, deep grammar that we were born with, genetically engraved ability to process language. And then your individual language, like Chinese or or English is actually just a, a, a plugs into this system that's genetically um, sort of preset. Then the stimulation of your own natural language meets up with this grammar and you end up getting this ability that other animals don't seem to have. So too there's this question about well did music evolve before language or after language? And until recently a, a book by anthropologist Stephen Mithin called the singing, uh, the singing Neanderthal. Most people suggested that language was much later than that, or that music was much later than language. Mithin has argued that no, music is probably before language or at least contemporaneous with language. And there's good reason for thinking this because one of the things you do in grammar is you're able to sort of take out little elements like phrases and embed them in other elements or phrases. So like, here's an example. I'm using a sentence now, and so I'm using words that you're familiar with, but I'm also adding clauses that you haven't quite heard in exactly this order, and now I'm adding another clause, even though I haven't come to the end of that sentence, and I'm able to keep adding phrases and clauses into these elaborate run-on sentences, and yet you can follow me and understand me despite never hearing that sentence before in your life. And so there is some unique quality that's called recursion in language that allows us to manipulate the symbols or the elements within 
in a way that actually builds up into larger and larger meaningful units. Now, Mithin suggests, and I would agree, and I argued in my book on the imagination, that music has these qualities too. Recursion is a huge, and sort of a grammar is a huge feature of music because you can take rhythmic units or melodic units and embed them within each other so that you're getting increasingly sophisticated meaning. Uh, and I believe you can do this with melody and rhythm long before you can do it with, you, you can do it without actually having linguistic grammar. So I believe it's a kind of pre-linguistic uh, form of grammar. Additionally, in order to be able to create music, you need a kind of cognitive fluidity. You need to decouple sounds from their origins and then be able to play with them. So presumably, you know, sounds that, you know, onomatopoeia sounds, like with a snake, you might have had sounds that described that creature at first, like tss, and then eventually, you know, you, you have words like snake, which don't sound or look in any way like a physical, biological creature snake, and yet they come to stand in for or represent. And so in music, it's the same way. That there needs to be a cognitive fluidity so that certain sounds, which might have scared you uh, or soothed you, can be decoupled from their origins, namely like an animal coming after you and snarling, snarling or your mother cooing to you as a baby. You can detach those sounds and then play with them and improvise with them and, until you can eventually create music with them and they still retain some of those emotional elements of their origin. And then, interestingly, there's this question of semantic content, and that's what I'm getting at. Let me, let's turn to that now and try to develop that in the time we have left. I know I'm, we don't have too much time here, but I want to try to get a, a fairly complex argument here mounted, at least in, in a sort of sketched version. Um, what are the neural systems um, underlying the brain, or rather, that, that sort of make up the brain? And this is a very schematic and crude way of thinking of the brain, but it's not a bad way to start. This is sometimes called the model of the brain, the triune brain. We don't think it's literally true because the brain is so interconnected at so many points that this is just incredibly crude, but it's helpful in a way. If you look at the old brain, the reptilian brain, we share this with all other vertebrates. This is sort of instinctual or reptilian brain. This is fight or flight. This handles, you know, sympathetic system, the kind of homeostatic systems of respiration and so forth. And then you have the limbic brain or the emotional feeling brain wrapped around that, things like the amygdala, the hippocampus is where memory is processed. And then largely, and then this larger neocortex, the rational or thinking brain, and the front of that area is basically like the executive functions. Now the reason why this is interesting is that in addition to thinking of the, the mind or the brain as being this kind of, these different ways of processing information, uh, both emotional and just cognitive. Uh, there's also a way of thinking about uh, these sort of task positive networks and when you're sort of engaging in mind wandering. So there are these brain, brain systems called the default mode network or the DMN. And this is basically a kind of mind wandering. When you're letting your mind free associate and you're just sort of look, you know, maybe you're having this experience. If my lecture's boring, you're looking out the window, you're thinking about yourself, you know, in your future, you're just sort of randomly imagining things. You're not really engaged in a task. That is a kind of default mode which your mind reverts to whenever you go off of specific kind of problem solving. It basically toggles back and forth with this attentional network, or sometimes called the task positive network, or the TPN. And this is when you have engaged attention. You are trying to solve a puzzle. It could be a math problem. It could be trying to figure out something on your phone. It could be, you know, working on an engine, or, or just trying to get from here to there and navigate a map. Um, it turns out that these have very clear brain signatures. And when you're in one mode, it lights up one part of the brain, and when you're in another mode, it lights up another part of the brain. And neuroscientists using fMRI can, uh, technology can track what is your brain doing when you're listening to music, or when you're creating music. And the results are pretty interesting. Some interesting features. One is pretty clear that um, 
many aesthetic experiences involve, and particularly creative experiences, involve the turning off of what's called the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. And this is a little part of the brain on both sides, sort of over you know, your temple area. And this part is very involved in executive function and sequential thinking and, and sort of, you know, one, one finds it associated with sort of logical sequential problem solving. But it turns out that when you're being really creative, particularly improvisers, um, this part of the brain shuts off. And the more you can shut this off, the more you get a kind of free play of imagination underneath it in the orbital frontal prefrontal cortex. And this uh, seems to be very um, effective and dominant during uh, free play improvisation like jazz players or uh, freestyle rappers. And so there's been some fairly interesting work done on this. Uh, a guy named Charles Lim did some uh, brain mapping. And what you're seeing here is a wonderful image in which the the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex is sort of gone off during an, an improvisation because he, he basically devised one of these fMRI chambers where the musician could lay in it, have their head examined, you know, mapped um, while they were playing keyboard. And so they were asked to play things that were written, they were asked to play things that were remembered, that were written, and they were also asked to improvise. And you got various, various different uh, subjects involved in this and he mapped it out quite nicely. And it turns out that when you're doing written music or following written text, then the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex is more on and processing. Whereas when you shift to these more improvisational styles, then this part of the brain goes quiet. And artists have sort of known this for a while intuitively, but perhaps uh, it's, it's just exciting now to see that there's this brain science corroboration. All right, um, what's happening then? I think that the semantics of music is very much tied to emotional meaning and our emotional experiences. What are the emotions? Um, that's something we're going to have to sort out, and there's a lot of debate about that, which I don't have time to get into. One of the questions I want to ask, though, is something I think a lot of people think about, I think particularly composers, why do we like sad songs? Why do we become aggressive when listening to certain Eminem or Black Sabbath records? Why do we feel amorous when uh, certain Marvin Gaye or Beyonce songs come on? Um, are there chords, melodies, and beats that uh, similarly trigger universal human emotional systems? And my research uh, suggests to me that there are, uh, I'm sort of following my teacher here, the founder of emotional neuroscience, uh, Dr. Jak Panksepp, I believe there are universal uh, emotional systems that we share with all other human beings. And music is very good at tapping into those emotional systems. What's the evidence for this? There's some wonderful studies. Um, in two th uh, 2015, a study exposed 40 Canadians and 40 Congolese pygmies to musical pieces, approximately equal number of Western and pygmy songs. Uh, and so I give you the, the citation there. The participants were continuously measured uh, for emotional responses, including subjective feeling reports, facial expressions, and physiological arousal. The physiological responses to music were measured by using a respiration belt, a blood volume pulse monitor, an electrodermal monitor, facial muscle detectors. So briefly, let me just summarize this. What they found was that when you played sort of you know, a similar kind of angry piece uh, of music, it, the physiological arousal states looked exactly the same or very similar in these different, two different uh, ethnocultural groups. Um, the, it, what's interesting is when they described what they were feeling, there was variation and deviation there, which is also kind of exciting and interesting because maybe it's the arousal states that are physiological that are common, but the interpretation of those arousal states are very culturally specific. That's kind of exciting. Uh, an even more uh, sort of strong uh, argument for universal emotions is another study from 2009. Um, and this showed that native African uh, Mafa people listened to Western music for the first time. And they successfully identified three basic emotions in respective songs. So they were able to agree what they thought was a happy song, a sad song, and a fearful song. Investigators interpreted this to mean that expression of basic emotions in Western music can be recognized universally. 
And the argument for that is, well, we share the same emotional systems, so if music has figured out a way to trigger those systems, then music will have cross will travel well. Music will travel across borders and people and touch them in very similar sorts of emotional ways. The argument for this has to do with uh, the, the affective layers. So I think that there is a kind of primary process set of emotions. These would be things like fear, uh, you know, uh, anger, you know, care or love, lust, what we would call love, but obviously in the animals we would call this lust. And these systems then are actually in human beings able to be conditioned at what's called a secondary process level. So um, here's an example. At the primary level, the fear system looks the same in my brain as it does in a rodent brain. It's the same neurochemistry, it's the same areas of the brain, it's, a, it, it's the same processing, and it's the same behavioral responses. But rats are afraid of the light, and so they'll run away from it because that was part of their sort of conditioning. Uh, whereas human beings are afraid of the dark. So same fear system, but also it's malleable enough to take in conditioning during the early life of the animal, during that sort of development um, of, of, of you individually in a culture. And then there's a third level, which is the tertiary process cognition. And here's where we can, using high level cognition, take emotions like fear and we can use imagination and concepts to elaborate them into high level art. So this is where, for example, if we can continue this analogy of fear, this is where you can get a whole aesthetic tradition of horror. This is where you get Stephen King and vampires and zombies. It's still arousing that same animal fear system of escape and, f and you want to run away or fight. But basically, you've got a very high level of aesthetic literature now involved and film and so forth. And my argument is that music is the same. Music takes emotional processing that is these at this elemental level, and then it, it finds a way to reactivate it in very sophisticated formats and organizations and compositions, such that it still has a power over the listener that is connected to these emotional roots, even though, of course, you can do very high-level conceptual stuff like John Cage, you know, sitting at the piano and so forth with no sound. Nonetheless, the vast majority of music is sort of, I believe, has this sort of emotional semantics to it. All right. Um, now, uh, music meaning, how does music have emotional semantic content? We now understand that uh, the sort of phenomenon of mirror neurons. And we, un we sort of learned this a couple of decades is when this was discovered, but it's had a lot of corroboration and it's got a robust sort of strengthening since then. We found that in certain primates that when they were holding, um, so let's say a banana, um, a certain part of their brain was lit up. But interestingly, the same part of their brain we discovered would light up when it observed us holding the banana. So the experimenter, when, when he or she held the banana, the same part of the, the, the monkey brain lit up. And it suggested this idea that the mind is mirroring um, other minds and other behaviors out there in the world. So you have a kind of mirroring or simulation system. And now there's a lot of evidence that, for example, in the case of empathy, this is what seems to be what's happening. So when you poke me in the finger with a pin, I'm going to have a sort of response. And it's going to be sort of in two different art parts of the brain, roughly speaking. Um, one is going to be that I'm having a, a very unique sort of uh, visceral feeling of pain and retreat. And the other is more sort of frontal area. Now what we found is that um, my brain lights up this when you, when you poke me with a pin, but also, if I'm even vaguely empathic, my brain also lights up in the pain areas when I see you getting poked with a pin. So I literally am sort of take, my brain is tasting a little bit of your pain. And why, the reason why this is suggestive is that it also applies to emotional development. This is the ontogeny that I was talking about earlier. As babies, we're constantly being stimulated by our mothers, our fathers, our caregivers, and we're having what are sometimes called matching vertical associations. So I'm seeing my mother's face, 
smiling and I'm also having a flood of good feelings of oxytocin and these internal opioids like endorphins. So what's happening is that certain kinds of visual perceptions are being associated as getting a sort of vertical match with feeling states. So smiles equal pleasure, frowns equal pain. There's a kind of matching that's happening or kind of wedding together of these associational states way before you ever have language. So we as babies are processing a ton of this stuff. And my argument is that I suspect this is what's happening when we're hearing the early motherese of the cooing of mothers, lullabies, family songs. We're getting a taste or a sense of music that's being connected to emotional states. These are sometimes called somatic markers. And somatic markers are elements of meaning. The embodied mind records associations into units of emotional resonance. Music is built upon these elements, some of which are effectively or emotionally positive and draw us to approach, and some of these are, are emotionally negative. They're, they're negatively valenced, and they motivate us to avoid to avoidance behavior. So composition is partly the organizing or structuring of these somatic markers in the listener. And of course, such organizing is going to be idiosyncratic. It's up to composers to sort of do this any way they want to. But if there are some universal patterns of sound and emotion, then composers can intuitively or explicitly recruit those elements in novel compositions. And so this is a, a way of sort of arguing for how music can have a kind of emotional semantics. What fires together wires together. We now have a lot of evidence that these sort of you know, seemingly banal experiences like mothers and caregivers cooing and sort of babbling to babies, it ends up, we think, being one of the foundational platforms for language itself. So why not one of the foundational platforms for music as well? And um, I'm just going to wind up this argument now with just a couple more images and then we're, we're done. I want us to think here about music not as sort of auditory cheesecake, as Pinker said, not as just purely aesthetics that, you know, only a kind of people of a certain leisure class can enjoy. I want us to think about music as a kind of pre-linguistic knowledge, that there is a form of pre-linguistic -pre communication between us before we have language as babies and before we had language as a species. And I believe that, that melody and rhythm is very much tied to this simulation system that we have. So here you see some kind of fun images. If you stick your tongue out to a chimpanzee, he'll stick his tongue out back at you and various other kinds of behaviors. How is that possible? <laughs> you know, why is that possible? Um, and the, the explanation is that, that there is this kind of mirror neuron simulation system that allowed us to engage in the kind of social learning that was very good for primates in general and human homo sapiens in particular. So if you've ever seen the haka dance that New Zealanders will do, they'll do this kind of dance where they stick their tongues out and they look kind of crazy and angry and they'll shout this and sort of chant this musical chant. And I defy you to watch this and not feel emotionally aroused and like aggressive and like you could basically beat the pulp out of somebody. It's a very emotional experience and it's all happening at the pre-linguistic level. And of course dance has this ability, um, mothers and babies are sort of simulating each other. And I believe that if you look back to the same time period as the early flutes and drums we were talking about, this is the early time in which you get sort of upper Paleolithic period where you get cave painting. And I, I want to suggest that cave painting and pictorial imagery is also a pre-linguistic form of knowledge and communication. And so I'll close with this. If you look on the left-hand side, this is sort of a summary of where we've been. What are the adaptive aspects of music? Uh, therapeutic, music is extremely helpful for the reduction or the amplification of emotion. So reducing emotions or ratcheting them up when we need them. Also crucial for social bonding. I'm also suggesting here that attentional, perceptual memory amplification. So music training as a kind of cognitive training. Now, I didn't say too much about this, but just think about it. There's a lot of evidence 
that musical training is actually very good for attention, as it crosses out of the musical domain and into other areas like math, um, people can even hear, uh, they've done these crazy tests where people with music training can actually hear a crying baby if you bury that sound in a bunch of noise. They can hear it better than non-musical, non-music, non-musicians. But there's a sense in which uh, musical training might actually just also really amplify cognition across the board into many other domains. Uh, it's also, I'm suggesting that improvisation increases cognitive fluidity. So the more you improvise musically, the more you're able to sort of problem solve in ways that deviate from the typical, you know, pathway. Uh, social, emotional prediction processing. I think the more you understand music and the more you perform music, the more you're, you might actually be, be good at social, emotional uh, processing about yourself and have, in terms of self-knowledge, but you might also understand the emotions of others better. And that, this one is a little more speculative, and here I'm going sort of beyond the data that we have now, but I do think it's going to turn out to be the case. And, um, and then lastly, on the right-hand side, none of this that I've been suggesting is designed to be reductionistic. I'm trying to give a picture of what we know from biology and evolution and brain science about music, but of course, aesthetics is a domain that sort of exists, you know, in relation to these kinds of um, cognitive science approaches. And I don't mean to diminish, diminish aesthetics in any way. Studying when, what is beautiful and what is not and why, totally legit. And I believe it dovetails nicely with what I've been suggesting here. But I'll close with a wonderful statement about the value of music uh, by the great uh, Bill Evans. And some of you will know this quote, but to me it it's really says it all. Bill Evans says, music should enrich the soul. It should teach spirituality by showing a person a portion of himself that he would not discover otherwise. It's easy to rediscover part of yourself, but through art, you can be shown part of yourself you never knew existed. That's the real mission of art. The artist has to find something within himself that's universal and which he can put into terms that are communicable to other people. The magic of it is that art can communicate to a person without his realizing it. Enrichment, that's the function of music. So I'll close there, and um, I hope that this will be something that, that might um, uh, maybe provoke you into new areas of thought or composition. And I appreciate your time and your attention. All right, take care.